home on every rural road. Hyundai Country Calendar. For this Marlborough Sounds family, sheep farming and mussel farming go together. If you put too many mussels onto your ropes, they don't grow. If you put too many sheep into a paddock, they don't grow. Don't keep your weeds down, keep the weeds at bay, they only get worse. So there is a lot of parallels there. And mussel farming has let them keep their ties to the land. Tim Shan says without it, he and his ten children would have moved on. The block of land we've got here would have been struggling to have sustained us a, a livelihood. If I hadn't been doing this, I probably would have had to go and find work elsewhere. The Shans first got into mussel farming about 20 years ago. Initially our thoughts were that mussel farming would never get out this far because it was too far from the from base and I know we'd be interested in farming mussels out here but that theory didn't last for very long. <laughs> now they've got 20 hectares of mussels growing in the outer reaches of Polaris Sound. Today they're taking juvenile mussels off the lines and giving them more space to grow. Till recently, harvesting and reseeding was done by contractors, but last year they bought this barge. Our main purpose of purchasing it was so we could just step up another stage in the mussel industry instead of just doing the basic float tying and that. It takes the barge over four hours to steam back to Havelock from here. But the Shans have discovered there are some advantages farming mussels this far out into the sound. Port Lagar's got ideal growing conditions. One of the main features is we've got deep water out here. This gives you that depth of water to be able to put your droppers down. I didn't realise how clean the water is here compared to up the sounds here. Some of the harvesting we've been, the outwork we've been doing with the boat up near the Havelock there, the ropes are still caked in mud after they've been through the washer. We don't get anything like that problem out here. Tim's son, Sebastian, has recently moved home to learn the ropes on the barge. He's been working in the mussel industry for the last five years, so he's uh, pretty skilled at it. Noel's the skipper we've got here at the moment. He said he's going to give me five years, and then uh, Seb will be able to run this boat for us. It's an idyllic landscape, but living here comes at a price. Yeah, no, it is good. But there's a catch with, with everything that's good, you've, uh, you've got to work for it. <laughs> but the first chance to drop anchor at Port Lagar had no thought of aquaculture. What drew Tim's family here was the land and farming. The property sits at the entrance to Pluris Sound, close to Cook Strait. Most of its 500 hectares is inside of the sea, and some of it's steep. It's been in the family nearly 90 years. My uh, grandfather came up here from down in South Canterbury in 1924. He decided he wanted to shift up to here because there wasn't enough for them to make a living down there. My growing up days, it was, my father was uh, running the place. My grandfather, he'd long since retired. and never really uh, had any reason to go, so I just sort of stayed. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure I've got the right one. One thing Tim's learnt is how to be self-sufficient. The nearest garage is an hour and a half away. You back in there again. I'm not a mechanic by any matter of means, but when you've got something that's broken down and you're able to yeah. fix it, you've just got to learn how to. Ah, oh, you're rat. I've just slowly built up a supply of tools over the years. Anything that's really useful, I'll uh, go out to town and purchase it. We've got welders and most spanner sets and socket sets and stuff like that and bits of metal for patching up things. This Utes had a hard life. Tim calls it the farm wheelbarrow. It's been rolled twice. Yeah, well she used to be a little bit more in one piece back in its uh, days when it was a legal wagon on the public roads. The first time it got crushed forward, yeah, and we had to chain block it back until it sort of got into its uh, roughly in its right place. The windscreen obviously wasn't replaced, the door wasn't replaceable, so we just left that off, and it's uh, 
it's <clears throat> more convenient not having the door there. And the second roll, it got uh, bent back. I think it was just, it was all bent right back against the roll bar there. And uh, so the next time the panel beating job involved tying a rope round the cab through the windscreen that wasn't there and up to the pear tree there. And we just kept back and back a few times, give her a few jerks and run up and down the road until it uh, got her all nice and square again, <laughs> like it is now. The problem with keeping a ready supply of tools and spare parts is storage space. Sometimes there's a bit of looking for the bits that haven't been used for a few years. It uh, does get worse than this. <laughs> At times when we don't get enough wet days and the projects build up, there's, uh, like this thing's been sitting here for about six or eight months waiting to be done and the projects always sort of build up the benches and the bench space gets less and less. Tim's wife moved to Port Lagar back in 1978. Ray Winshand grew up in Marlborough and met Tim in the early 70s. She knew the sounds, but moving to Outer Polaris was like going back in time. Ten-year-old Azan is the youngest of ten children Tim and Rowan have raised on this remote station. I don't really know if anybody's ready for it, actually. It's something that it's not easy. Hey, Shani. Hi. It was hard. The nearest neighbour is like half an hour's drive. When I came on the scene, I was the youngest by a long way. The rest of the family was quite a lot older. These days, there's grown-up children and a steady stream of visiting workers to the bay. It's looking good, Kat. Steps are looking great. But in the late 70s, the 21-year-old bride had little idea of what was in store. I don't really think that at that age you, you think the long-term thing really through. You were just young and in love. Yeah. I guess that's the way it was. <laughs> young and in love, maybe. Okay, but for Raywin, the challenges weren't just dealing with the isolation at Port Lagar. For the last 34 years, she's taken charge of the education of all 10 of her children. OK, so what do you do to just...? I guess sometimes you just, just, you just get on. You just do it. Farming in the outer reaches of the Marlborough Sounds is tough. Today, Tim Shan's mustering his farm's steepest block. We're just about as far as you can go in the South Island and uh, till you run into the ocean. We've farmed here for 45, 50 years, I suppose. My father, with the help of a contractor, they put the road out round through the rocks here. It must have been quite challenging back then for them to have uh, put a road round here. The machinery was fairly antiquated back in those days compared to what we've got these days. It's been a useful road. It's steep, but it's still hanging in there. <laughs> the terrain is testing but by far the biggest challenge is keeping sheep farming viable in such an isolated place. At least there's no shortage of labour. For Tim, having plenty of kids has taken some of the pressure off. It can be challenging at times by yourself and that, but in recent years I've had uh, plenty of helpers, so it's eased up the workload a bit. I can see you. Tim originally farmed all this land in partnership with his brother. When wool prices fell, half the block was sold. That made the viability of sheep farming at Port Lagar, a struggle at the best of times, even more precarious. Well, the wool was the important thing, and, and um, meat was a sideline, but the, the last 20 years, when wool prices have not been so good with um, changed over from the purebred Romneys to uh, anything that'll grow meat and the wool's been a, been a sideline. Oh, 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 shut up! It's hard, but that, that's all I've ever known is this whole country and I've grown up with it and so we just accept it as our lot and uh, we just farm it to the best of the ability as we can and, and, uh, and make do. To stay, they've had to adapt. Our livelihood was solely out of the sheep, but as you can see from the background there now, we're, uh, we've moved our farming operation out into the ocean as well. 
you're more likely to find mussel bags than wolf edges on the wharf at Port Lagar these days. Tim says things have changed. In the 1940s, boat access was your only choice because there was no roads on the farm. And it was just horses walking and boat. They still share sheep here, but the wool is almost a byproduct. Anson Shand, the oldest son, is back on the farm after several stints overseas. What? He moved back to Port Lagar permanently last year. Anson and his partner Mara are gradually taking over the reins of the farm. How's it going there, Anson? Oh, you ain't getting the feel yet. There's a bit, bit of condition on that. All right, though. Yeah, no, it's not bad. Two small ones coming through might have to hold back. Yeah. There's probably about a dozen lambs, ewe lambs here, might be worthwhile picking out, so we'll just draft them off at the top of the hill. Yeah, it could be a good game. There's plenty of willing helpers, but Tim says they're now one of the few sheep farms left in the sounds. A lot of the farmers have uh, just basically given up and it's just going, going back to scrub and rubbish. Like Coming down from Havelock 40 years ago, you would be inside of farmland the whole way down. There'd be just an odd bit of native bush and everything else was farmland, grazing land, but now there's hardly any. When they're not out on the farm, the younger shans can be found hitting the books. This kitchen has been both a social and learning hub for Raywin and Tim's children since the late 70s. 13-year-old Mahalia, 10-year-old Azan, and his older sister Shoshana are the last three of 10 shans that have been educated at home. But the lessons have changed. How are we doing? Huh? 30 years ago, there was only one curriculum on offer. Back then, in those days, it was just correspondence school. We didn't know any different, and that's what we did. It was just incredibly overwhelming. Oh, so I'm still doing... And I remember unloading it all and just sitting on the floor and bursting into tears because it was just so much. Too much. And it's still like that today. What can you remember what we did yesterday? Um, With all the children, there's a real mixture of abilities. They're all really bright and they're all switched on, but when it comes to academically, to they're all different. I don't like putting kids into boxes, okay. but if you're going to, they all, they, I've got okay, so several different these. boxes. Because yeah. mathematicians didn't have an income. That's right. Because back then, mathematicians weren't considered to be of any consequence. What did they think that they should do? By the time her third child got to school age, okay. so Raywin was having serious concerns about the curriculum. Yeah, um, I remember one time sitting here at the table trying to get her to write a story because that was in the curriculum and you had to do it. And she just she just wasn't ready for that sort of stuff. And I said, you know, you've got to, if you don't, we all had lunch, we were all eating lunch. And I said, you're not getting your lunch until you've eaten, you know, written the story. I can't believe, the, you know, how cruel it was. But And the story she wrote said, I don't know what to write, mum won't let me eat. And I like, that is, you know, that, and I was like, if that's what I have to do to force my kids to learn, it's not right. And so we started looking around at other things. The system Raywin's ended up with treats every opportunity as a chance to pick up knowledge, whether it be in the kitchen, in the garden, or out on the farm checking the possum traps. We do not homeschool our children. We have not brought them home to lock them up inside four walls and tie them to a desk. Uh, we home educate, and home education is 24-7, 365. So every opportunity is educational. There's outside stuff, there's inside stuff, there's kitchen stuff, there's sewing stuff. One of my kids did taxidermy. They do pest control. I met another homeschooling mum in the last couple of years, found out that she was a harp teacher, and little bells went off in my head, and I was like, hmm, I think Mahalia could do quite well at harp. The system's worked well, and there's graduates to prove it. Until the early 70s, access to Port Lagar and the Outer Pora Sound was solely by boat. Oh, there's my boy. He's just turned up. Nowadays, Raywin Shand and her kids routinely travel by car. 
but getting in and out of this isolated bay is a long trek. It's 121 kilometres each way to the centre of Nelson. The first hour and a quarter is unsealed. I think technically it's called a gravel road, but there's not a lot of gravel on it. But the roads have improved immensely. I mean, I used to think people were insane if they went out to town back in the day from out here. And now we hop in the car and we moan because we've got a few potholes and a few ruts. <laughs> Because of the distance, Raywin organises each trip well in advance. They are usually planned to reasonable precision, especially when I'm trying to fit all the children's uh, activities in, because um, I have to fit in with other people. So I'm pretty pedantic about getting everything ticking along, and so I know that I can physically get uh, to each place you know, for each appointment, each lesson, whatever I'm doing. Long trips to Nelson on dusty roads are just a memory for the older Shan children, but they still love coming back to Port Lagar. Catriona Shand is a climber and rigger and lives with her partner on a yacht in Wellington. She regularly sails home across Cook Strait. Setting a net is high on her list when she's home. Do you want me to give your hand to... Uh... Cut this up. Yeah, I can't remember really how to do it. <laughs> I've done them in ages. While you're sorting out that. Cat's well travelled, but she reckons this place is hard to beat. I love coming home. I mean, I live just over in Mana, which takes me about eight hours on my yacht to sail back, so I try and come home whenever I can, whenever my boss will let me go. <laughs> Hunting, diving, it's a great lifestyle, actually. You know. you sort of, yeah, I really enjoy being kind of self sufficient, you know, being able to go and catch what you want to eat. Or, Hunt what you want to eat. Yeah, I don't really like buying meat from the supermarket. Couldn't wait to get out of you know schoolwork and get out and help Dad on the farm, or go out fishing with my brother, or wouldn't swap it for anything. Eh? I always felt sorry for kids growing up in town. They must get so bored, you know, on their playstations all the time and watching TV. Cat's not the only one of the ten siblings who loves being home. Anson Shan travelled a fair stretch of the world as a shearer. He's been back over a year. No matter where I've been, it's still, you can't get what you got here. That's not to say farming's easy. It's hard country. Sit there. Because of the terrain, you can't irrigate and, or put crops or anything like that in winter feed or anything. So you're subject to the, the weather. You can get most of the farm on the the old farm hack or the motorbike, and other than that, yeah, you're just on your two feet walking. All bloody good dogs. But others in this family have also done the hard yards. Oh, some days you're out there, you think you've had a dead set prick of a day, and you, yeah, you know, well, 50 years ago or 70 years ago, or whatever, and great granddad or granddad was trying to run it. They had a lot worse than what we've got it these days, so you shouldn't really complain too much about it. Anson's dedicated to keeping it running without too many chemical inputs. The way the farm's been run at the moment, it's pretty much organic. It just hasn't got the certificate to go with it. Yeah, sheep are still pretty healthy and everything's still ticking over, so I don't see the point in trying to change it too much. But there's no question it's the mussel farm that's enabled the Shans to hang on to the land. These days, routine maintenance takes up as much time as the land-based farming. Yeah, right, I'm going to get another, um, another batch of kai tai come down so we can put another half ton along that after years of running both businesses on his own, Tim's thrilled that his children are getting involved. But he's not quite ready to retire. I still enjoy work. I'd still like to, as long as I'm able to, to take a lesser role in the land-based operation and in the sea-based operation. You reckon I'll make it by, um, by June? Yeah. Well, I've been doing it for uh, quite a few years now, so it's sort of uh, probably hard just to walk away from it too quickly. <laughs> but I'll definitely be uh, taking a, a lesser role in it. With Seb at the helm of the mussel farm and older brother Anson mustering the hills, Tim and Raywin have had time to sit back and reflect on over 30 years together in this part of the Sounds. Neither of them started out with the master plan, but it's clear they're both happy to have their large family with them and still be able to call Port Lagar home. I never thought I'd have very many children. 
but they just sort of seemed to keep turning up, so we ended up with quite a few. <laughs> And uh, I have no regrets whatsoever. Each and every one of them is excessively precious to us. They do love coming back. I'm not sure whether they like coming back here or they like coming back to see us. They haven't quite got that sorted yet. Huh? No, they, um, yeah, they all like to think of us as home. I guess uh, my subconscious goal in life has to be that they are responsible that they're honest, that they can go out into life and not be a burden to anybody. And so far, I haven't had one child on the dole. They've all had very interesting lives, each and every one of them. The environment we've brought the children up in here that has made them self-sufficient. Lawyer said to us one day that well, one thing he regretted was losing the family farm, because his children couldn't travel the world and get an atlas out and say, that spot on that map there is that's home. And I thought, yeah, you, you can't buy that. And not a bad place to call home. No. Yeah. It's a pretty good place, isn't it? Country Calendar is brought to you by Hyundai New Zealand.